welcome back to part two. Um, to, to date, we'll be looking at chapters four, five, and six of Indians, Jacks, and Pines. And doing the reading tonight is my wife, Frankie Morrison. So I'm going to turn that over to her, and she's starting chapter four, The White Man Comes. The white man came to Michigan in 1701 and established Fort Potatrain, which later became Detroit. It was to be another 114 years before the first white man settled permanently at what now is Saginaw, only 90 miles north. Michigan, being a peninsula, was out of the path of the great westward push of civilization from the east coast. The pioneers traveled west, primarily through Ohio and Indiana, to the Mississippi River. Detroit and Chicago were thriving cities before the Indians in the central part of the Lower Peninsula were aware their way of life was to change. In 1807, the treaty with the Ottawas was signed in Detroit and the name of Saginaw appeared for the first time. The United States further stipulates to furnish the said Indians with two blacksmiths, one to reside with the Chippewas at Saginaw. However, there is no evidence that the blacksmith ever came. With this treaty, the Ottawas, Potawas, Wyandots, and Chippewas ceded a great section of southeast Michigan. This was the first large land settlement between the Indians and the whites of Michigan Territory and was the entering wedge that eventually was to turn all of Michigan over to the white settlers. The land remaining to the Indians was in odd shape piece with Saginaw about the geographic center. Into this happy hunting ground of virgin forest, abundant game, and one of the last strongholds of Indian life in Michigan came Lewis Campbell in the fall of 1815. He wasn't the first white man here, but he was the first to stay. The Saginaw country was mentioned vaguely in writings of Jesuit priests in papers termed the Jesuit Relations, but there is no actual proof the Jesuits ever visited here. In the days of their explorations, the route of travel to the upper Great Lakes was through Georgian Bay, some 200 miles northeast of Saginaw. A white man, Francis Trombley, did visit the Saginaw area in 1792, but his stay was brief. Campbell, the nephew of a wealthy Detroit merchant who dealt largely in furs, was in his middle 20s when his uncle sent him to Saginaw as a fur trader. Campbell came to Saginaw in a sailing vessel. He built himself a long trading post house on a point of high river bank near the present intersection of Hamilton and Clinton Streets. Fur traded was big business in those days. The furs purchased from the Indians were set to, mar to market in the East and to Europe. Although Campbell was the first white fur trader to establish in Saginaw, other fur traders were active in the area and competition was keen. Campbell's most quickly became a center of activity along the Saginaw River. He had a pleasant personality and the Indians liked and trusted him. This was a genuine tribute because there are, were many dishonest traders. A common practice among traders was to give a gun for a pile of beaver pelts as high as the gun was long. Some traders had cheap flintlocks made with barrels six feet long. It took a lot of beaver pelts to make a pile that high, but the gun was no good and few Indians let themselves be, che be cheated more than once. Campbell was firmly established at Saginaw by 1819. By this time, the land-hungry whites were pursuing, were pressure, um, excuse me, were pressuring the federal government to take over all lands remaining to the Indians in Michigan. The whites wanted the Indians to move west beyond the Mississippi River. General Lewis Case, or Lewis Cass, 
one of the heroes of the War of 1812, was governor of Michigan Territory, and also served as superintendent of Indian Affairs for the federal government. He was 36 and highly respected by the government. He was commissioned by the government to negotiate with the Indians at Saginaw to acquire for the United States the Indian land. General Cass asked Campo to prepare for the great powwow with the Indians. Runners were sent out to notify the tribes of the meeting. The time for the talks was set for the middle of September 1819, but General Cass, in reviewing past treaties with the Indians, found there were some important details that had not been followed by the government. In the Treaty of 1807, the government had promised to pay each year to the Chippewas $1,666.66 for use of their lands ceded in that treaty. This payment never had been made. Cass realized he had, if he had hoped to talk the Indians into another treaty, the terms of the other one had to be met. He couldn't wait to send word by courier to the government in Washington. So on his own, he borrowed the money from Detroit bankers and then wrote to the Secretary of War, John Calhoun. It would be hopeless to expect a favorable result of the proposed treaty unless the annuities previously due are discharged, Cass wrote. Under these circumstances, I have felt myself embarrassed and no course has been left me but to procure the amount of the Chippewa annuity upon my private responsibility. By the liberal conduct of the directors of the bank at this place, I have succeeded. I trust the recipient of a draft will soon relieve me from the situation in which I am in and enable me to perform my promise to the bank. General Cass sent a company of infantry under his brother, Captain Charles L. Cass, to Saginaw by boat as a military guard. The general himself went to Saginaw over the Indian Trail, arrived on September 10th. Campo had prepared the powwow meeting place excellently, a spacious council house that included a platform of logs elevated a foot above the ground had been built. Here the general was to sit. Big logs, the bark still on them, were rolled into the house as seats for the Indian chiefs. Not many Indians were present when General Cass arrived, so runners were sent to notify the missing chiefs and tribal leaders. Cass, however, did not wait for the tardy ones, but opened treaty talks at once. During the conference, which lasted several days, between 1,500 and 4,000 persons were present. Most of them Indians, some white traders also attended. Cass spoke through an interpreter. He told the Indians how the great white father in Washington wanted to take care of them. The wild game is getting scarce, he said. The great white father wants you to give up hunting. He wants you to live in one place and become farmers. He wants to give you land beyond the Mississippi River. The Indians were primitive and uncivilized, but they knew what they wanted, and they didn't want to move out of Michigan beyond the Mississippi. They wanted to stay on their hunting grounds. Chief Agama, Ogama, sorry, who lived at what is now Midland, spoke for the Indians. He told General Cass the Indians wouldn't move away, and the first session ended on this announcement. Realizing he had no hope of convincing the Indians they should get out of Michigan, so the white man could now move in, General Cass softened his demands. He told the Indians that if they would sign the treaty, they could continue to hunt in the forest. The Indians thought they had won a victory, and on September 24, 1819, the treaty was signed by General Cass and 114 chiefs. Among the provisions of the treaty was one that the government would pay the Chippewa Nation a thousand dollars in silver every year. Another was the reservation of land to John, James, and Peter Riley, sons of James 
V.S. Riley and the Chippewa woman, Minakamo uh, Ego Kwa, the Rileys uh, had given the government aid in the War of 1812 and also had served as guide to General Cass in Detroit. This aid, no doubt, was the cause of the generous gifts of land. John's land was within the corporate limits of what now is Bay City. James received a part of what later became East Saginaw, and Peter's land covered what later became Carleton Township. None of the Rileys ever took up permanent residence here and later told, sold the land. Their names, however, still appear on abstracts of property as original owners. The treaty set up reservations for the Indians, but in later agreements, these were wiped out, and the Indians received certain lands in Isabella County, still reserved for, to their use. Louis Campbell re remained in Saginaw until 1826, when he moved westward and settled in Grand Rapids. He was succeeded here by... Antone Campo, a relative who carried on the fur business. Lewis bought a large tract of land in the very heart of Grand Rapids and became one of the founding fathers of that city. <clears throat> General Cass remained as military governor of Michigan Territory until 1831, when he resigned to become Secretary of War under President Andrew Jackson. He left his name in countless places in Michigan, Cass Avenue in Saginaw, Cass County, and at least one high school has been named for him, Cass Technical High in Detroit. Chapter 5, Fort Saginaw. Once the treaty was signed and the United States government began to sell land to settlers, this angered the Indians. They realized for perhaps the first time the spoken word of the white man, assuring them that they could continue hunting in the forest and the written word, which gave title to the land to the government, could carry two different meanings. Although General Cass had said the Indians could go to and from their wigwams without interference, the white settlers did not want Indians walking across their property. The Indians became unruly and frightened the settlers. Pressure was put on the government by the settlers for protection, and in 1822 the government decided to establish a military fort at Saginaw. On May 22, 1822, General Wilford Scott sent an order to, Cor to Colonel Nyland Pickney of the 3rd Infantry at Green Bay, Wisconsin, to select two companies and go to Saginaw. Colonel Pickney chose Major Daniel Baker to head the force. Major Baker was told the quartermaster at Detroit would send the nails, hinges, locks, glass, and other articles necessary for the houses for the soldiers. The Green Bay soldiers were told to take seeds with them in order to grow the vegetables they would need. Early in June, the schooner Superior was loaded with supplies at Green Bay. Several of the men took along their wives and children. The schooners stopped at Mackinac Island in the Straits of Mackinac to exchange some articles of clothing. About June 18, the ship entered the Saginaw River. Major Baker selected the fort's location at what now is Court and Hamilton Streets, where the Hotel Fordney now stands. The fort was about 200 feet wide and 350 feet long. It was on the river shore, and a high bank plunged deeply, steeply to the water's edge. The fort was built of heavy hardwood posts or pickets, mostly oak, cut on three sides. These posts were set deeply into the ground. They stood 10 feet high above the ground and were tied together by stout strips of oak bark. There were two main gates. One opened on what is now Michigan Avenue. The second opening, known as the Water Gate, was towards the river. These gates were 12 feet wide and 12 feet high. The soldiers made certain if an Indian tried to climb over, it would be a difficult climb. But it wasn't the Indians that gave the soldiers trouble. Summer evenings in Michigan today 
can be made troublesome by mosquitoes. Imagine what it was like in 1822. The mosquitoes bred by the millions in the swampy lands along the river, and there was no protection against them. At night, a person might hide his head under a blanket. But on a hot day or a hot night, this was almost as unbearable as the mosquito sting. The mosquitoes infected the soldiers with malaria, then termed argue, or merely the fever. Soon reports were reaching Detroit that the Saginaw Fort was an unhealthy location. This report arrived at a time when men of wealth were eyeing the wilderness around Saginaw as a likely spot for develop, development of a town. Many men were busy buying land and selling it to Easterners who wanted to move to the frontier. These businessmen feared that the reports of sickness at Saginaw might frighten off their prospective land buyers. So the reports were concealed and the Saginaw area continued to be advertised as a healthy place to build a new family. These land speculators were helped with their story by nature. As winter came on, the swamps froze, the mosquitoes disappeared, and there was no sickness. All winter, the government land surveyors were busy. There was little for the soldiers to do other than drill, keep warm, and shoot enough game to keep fresh meat on the table. The Indians had no thought of making war. When spring came, back came the mosquitoes and the fever. The soldiers protested so loudly about being kept at Fort Saginaw that the government finally gave in. When Detroit learned the fort was to be abandoned, the land speculators became alarmed and sent a letter to the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, saying, The flourishing village of Saginaw is beautifully situated, and the health of the inhabitants is equal to any village in the territory. It also added that within five years, Saginaw would be the capital of Michigan. This flourishing village flourished only in the minds of those businessmen who had land to sell. The real facts were, were told in a letter from a Captain Garland to the Commanding General, Department of the East. Sir, it is my duty to apprise the Commanding Officer of this department that this garrison is now in a most deplorable situation. Major Baker and Lieutenant Baker are both dangerously ill of remittent fever. All the officers belonging to the command are sick except myself. The doctor was so much indisposed this morning as to make it necessary for me to send to Detroit for a physician. There are scarcely enough well men left to take care of the sick. Dr. John L. Whiting of Detroit went to Fort Saginaw in answer to the plea for medical help. He found the fort's regular physician, Dr. Pitcher, so ill he had to be carried to the bedside of his patients. Even Dr. Whiting came down with the fever after spending three weeks at the fort. The order to abandon the fort was signed September 16, 1823, and sent from headquarters on Governor's Island, New York by Indian runner. The orders reached Fort Saginaw in October, and on October 26, the soldiers boarded a ship on Saginaw River and sailed for Detroit. Saginaw's days as a military outpost were at an end. The fever the soldiers suffered was not a fatal one. There were two deaths at the fort during the year, <clears throat> but those resulted from typhoid fever. Although settlers also suffered from the malarial fever, the sickness was not bad enough to drive them out of the Saginaw Valley. Fort Saginaw was completely abandoned in 1824, and in the spring of that year, it was sold to Samuel W. Dexter, for whom Dexter in Washita County is named. Dexter deeded to Saginaw County, the land on which the courthouse stands and designated the property on the northwest corner of the present court or of the present court in Michigan as commons. The deed has prohibited the county from selling this land or building on it. I know that. Chapter six. Alexis D. 
Takwa Bill. Um, I'm sure I said that wrong. As late as 1830, the Saginaw area had not felt the heavy hand of civilization to any extent. There were some scattered cabins of white men. The small settlement of Saginaw hugged the river shore and actively was confined largely to the trading post. Fifteen miles down the river towards Saginaw Bay, another settlement was beginning to take shape. It was known as Lower Saginaw. Now it is known as Bay City. No roads led to these settlements. Only men on horseback or foot could travel to them in the spring or summer. In the winter, they could go by sled over the frozen surfaces of the rivers. <coughs> by the time Detroit and Chicago were major Midwestern cities, um, but along the Saginaw, the mosquito mos Masaga rattlesnake, wolf, panther, bear, and deer far outnumbered the humans. Into this wilderness came a young French nobleman, Alexis de Tocqueville, for the purpose of gathering material for a book. He first visited Detroit, then a city of 3,000 persons. He asked a major bindle, the government agent for sale of wild lands, where he should travel to get the best look at Michigan. There is a settlement at Pontiac, Bindle said, but beyond that, the country is covered by forests so thick you would get lost. It is full of nothing but wild beasts and Indians. Major Bindle suggested that de Tacqueville go west to St. Joseph, but the chance of visiting a wilderness was more than a Frenchman could ignore. He followed the military road as far as it went, Pontiac. At that time, Pontiac had 20 houses, some stores, and two inns. All of this nestled in a square, in a square mile of covered land. He and his companion, another Frenchman, who also published a book entitled Marie, in which he too described the Saginaw area, stayed overnight at one of the inns. They soon had the innkeeper in conversation. Ever get preachers up this way? Once in a while, the innkeeper said. Almost every summer, some Methodist minister appears. The news is passed around from house to house, and on the day he is to preach, there's quite a crowd. Arrival of a minister is a great event. De Tocqueville leaned back in his chair. We want to get up to Saginaw. The innkeeper was horrified. You want to go to Saginaw? A foreign gentleman, an intelligent man, wants to go to Saginaw? Impossible. Why? He asked. But are you aware what you are undertaking? The innkeeper said, "Do you know that Saginaw is the last inhabited, un, the last inhabited, inhabited spot northwest to the Pacific? That between this place and Saginaw lies an unclean, uncleared wilderness. Do you know that the forest is full of Indians and mosquitoes? That you must sleep at least one night under damp trees? Have you thought about the fever? But De Tocqueville." was insistent. Finally, the innkeeper told him which trail to take. By evening the next day, he and his companion and guides were five miles south of what now is Flint. The silence of the forest was so deep, the calm was so complete, that the forest, forces of nature seemed paralyzed. No sound was heard but the annoying hum of the mosquitoes and the stomp of our horses' feet. Now and then we saw the distant gleam of a fire against which we could trace through the smoke the stern and motionless profile of an Indian. <clears throat> the sound of an animal barking echoed through the woods, and the party hurried towards the sound. Soon they came upon a log cabin separated from them by a fence. 
he started to climb the fence when out of the moonlight reared a big black bear. It was chained but was very close and waved its huge forelegs as if wishing to embrace the intruder. What an infernal country, he snorted, keeping bears for watchdogs. A man appeared at the cabin door and looked the travelers over closely. Then he turned to the bear, go to bed, drink. drink. They are not robbers. The man then invited the travelers to spend the night in his cabin. The next day, de Tagueville hired two other Indians to guide his party to Saginaw. They arrived on the bank of the Saginaw River after dark. The guides signaled three times with savage yells, then pulled their blankets around them to keep off the mosquitoes and settled down on the river bank to wait. In a few minutes, there was a faint noise and an Indian canoe approached the bank. The man in the canoe wore the dress and had the appearance of an Indian. He spoke to the guides who took the saddles from the horses and put the saddles in the canoe. As de Tocqueville prepared to step into the canoe, the man tapped him on the shoulder and said pleasantly, Ah, you are from old France. Don't be in a hurry. People sometimes get drowned here. If de Tocqueville's horse had spoken to him, he couldn't have been more surprised. He looked at the man whose face shone in the moonlight like a copper ball. Who are you? You speak French, but you look like an Indian. I am Boyas Brule, which is in your language means the son of a Canadian and an Indian woman. De Tagueville settled himself in the bottom of the canoe. In one hand he held the bridle of his horse. As the canoe slipped through the water, the horse swam alongside. Then the canoe returned to the other side of the, for other members of the, the group. All my life I shall remember the second time the canoe neared the shore, de Tagwell wrote. The full moon was just rising over the prairie behind us. Half the disk appeared on the horizon. It looked like a mysterious door through which we could catch a glimpse of the light of another world. Its rays were reflected in the stream and touched the place where I stood. Along the line of the pale light, the Indian canoe was advancing. The bark glided rapidly and smoothly along narrow and black, resembling an alligator in pursuit of its prey. Behind came the horse, his powerful chest throwing up the waters of the Saginaw in glittering streams. In the whole scene, there was wild grandeur, which made an impression that has never been forgotten. Thirty persons, men, women, and children, lived at Saginaw at that time. Within two or three years, the town would begin to take shape, and this place which de Tagueville described as the westernmost outpost of a fur-flung civilization, excuse me, of a fire-flung civilization, would assume the role of the lumber capital in the, of the world. The Tagwell's visit never was forgotten in Saginaw when the present east side post office was built. It was designed after de Tagwell's ancestral Chateau in France, perhaps the only post office in the United States to so honor a casual visitor to the Wilderness Outpost. Okay, thank you, Frankie. And before we close this um, second installment of Stuart Gross's 1962 book, he there was mention in there that the um, Jesuits had not or there wasn't evidence that the Jesuits had spent much time in the Saginaw area. And I'd ask you to take a look at my uh, video here on YouTube, the Auburg Crucifix, based on the Michigan frontier, because there's substantial evidence that they indi indeed did spend quite a bit of time in, in uh, what would become Saginaw. And then if you'd like to hear another, sto another story that my wife Frankie told um, here on my channel, um, please check out the video, The Deer Men, 
or dear man, excuse me, and it's a true story, and she tells it very, very well. So thank you for uh, for stopping by, and look in a couple days for the next three chapters in Indians, Jackson Pines.